to worship and to celebrate. God is continuing to work and to move. We had a great Sunday last Sunday as we celebrated the work of the Holy Spirit in and through our lives. Isn't it good to know He doesn't just work one day out of the year? Amen. <laughs> He's still with us. And we're going to continue that celebration of the work of the Spirit as we come together, as we worship today. Let's stand together as we start off and as we celebrate that we have a good, good Father who loves us, who cares about us, who's working in and through us. Amen? Amen. I've heard a thousand stories of what That's a lot. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. Um, we at the youth group had a lock-in Friday to Saturday, so I'm still kind of sluggish. I'm still kind of tired. We had around, I want to say, 10 students, um, and we had me, my wife, and Sean helping out with the night. It was fun. We did a warrior night. If you see 
random stuff on the floor, please throw it away. Um, <laughs> but we had fun celebrating kind of what it means to put on the armor of God and talk about the, um, being a warrior for Christ. And it kind of fits with this weekend of uh, celebrating Memorial Day weekend. Um, so we, we want to thank you guys as a youth group for how you support us. Um, and we want to thank um, all the veterans and people who have laid down their life to give us a freedom to worship. Um, to worship God, to learn about God, and to pass this on to the next generation. Um, I am blessed to have my job, and I'm blessed to work with these teens. I think Pastor Tim has announcements. Yes, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Hopefully God is working in and through your life in amazing ways, and he's continuing to draw you near. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, one is that... Uh, Next Sunday, we are doing Lunch with the Leaders, or Lunch with Leaders, and in this we want to invite anyone who's come in the last year, started coming to the church in the last year or since COVID, if you go a little bit over, you know, from, since COVID hit really last year, um, we want to invite you to come, st stay after church next week, and hang out and get to know our pastoral staff will be there, different leaders will be there, um, you can ask questions, if you have any questions about what's going on, uh, you can... Just get to know more about the church, pay NAS, and about what we're doing, where we're going. Uh, learn more about ways you can get involved uh, in ministry with us. And so that is for this next, um, next Sunday. And there's clipboards. Should be in each section. If you're wanting to come or planning to come to that this next Sunday, please sign up on that. So we know, mainly so we can know how much food to prepare uh, to have that ready so uh, those clipboards are coming around if you want to sign up and get that back we'd appreciate that also want to let let you know that uh, um, Idaho Food Bank our mobile food pantry is this Wednesday this coming Wednesday it goes from 10 until they get done which is usually around 5 in the evening um, but if you're wanting to help out with it if you could be here at 830 to help get the truck unloaded and we can get stuff set up um, and then the, the actual food bank, will, food distribution will start at 10 o'clock. Uh, if, if you know of anyone or that might need uh, help out, uh, tell them to come on down, and we will, we will share in that. All right. Then also coming up uh, is chilling and grilling. Uh, Pam and I love to have people over. And so we've got chilling and grilling. We invite you over. You come over. We barbecue. Pam and I provide the meat. Uh, you bring side dishes, and we just hang out together for a little while. There's sign-up sheets out on the out in the foyer at the information booth, and you can be a so you can be a part of that. Um, also, need to let you know, we are in need of helpers in the nursery. Um, we are scrambling for this Sunday just to get people in there to be able to to watch the kids. We have a number of young families that are coming, and we want to let them know that we care about them, we love them. And so if you have any interest, um, or if you, we could twist your arm enough that you would say, yeah, I can help out there, I know that they would love to help. What they try to do is once a quarter, so one time every three months, uh, to volunteer and to be, to be in there and help out. I know that, that uh, they would love to have that help. So if you can uh, talk to Savannah, um, or Pat Stutzman uh, about that. We'd love to get that going. Also, just want to let you know, uh, we've had a number of new people coming, and uh, you may have noticed we haven't been passing offering plates because of COVID. <laughs> we, and we had, so we quit doing that for a little while. Um, we're probably going to come back to that here in a little bit. But until then, we have a church back here. Uh, it says ties and offerings on it. If you have offering you want to give, you can just drop it in there. Um, and it gets it gets taken out and counted each week. And so if, if you want to drop your offering or your tithes in that, that would be great. All right. Jim, you got some stuff going on with, with men. You want to just use yours? Yes, sir. Thank you. So a couple of events coming up for men's ministry. Um, Saturday, June the 12th. There we are, right there. We have a men's ministry fishing trip. Um, we're going to, I would like to have a quick meeting right up here 
in this area of the sanctuary right after church, maybe go about five minutes, we'll pass around the clipboard and get a sign-up thing going. The bottom line is, if you want to come out, if you don't have a license, no big deal, that's a free day for the state. But we are going to be meeting here at eight, leaving here at 8 o'clock in the morning, going up to Paddock Reservoir. So if you want to join us for our meeting right after uh, church service, right up front here. And then the, the evening following that, Sunday the 13th, at 5.30 here at the church is going to be our next men's movie night. We're going to be having a, a Christian comedian uh, CD by Brad Stein. So feel free to come and join us for that. Check with myself or Alex if you have any questions. All right. Sounds good. Other Jim. <laughs> your, your other brother Jim. Huh? Yeah. I have an announcement regarding uh, summer Sunday school. Uh, during the summer, it starts June 6th, next Sunday. They're telling me to speak up. Sorry. Sunday school in the summer starts June 6th, next Sunday. It'll go through August 29th. And according to Pastor Tara, Pastor Johnny, the children's church and the youth Sunday school will continue as currently uh, operating. According to Pastor Tim and, and, and Adele, the adults and Olympians will meet in the fellowship hall at 915, where they will have uh, some, <coughs> some food, I guess, for half an hour fellowship and for half an hour um, study. Uh, <coughs> you know, for adults, we only have one avenue of Christian growth called Sunday school. And so there's a, there's a consideration in the, in the mill to start in January to look at Christian 101, 102, 103, 104, so that no matter what stage you're in as a spiritual person, you'll have an opportunity to gain more. Now, these are basics, uh, mostly, and uh, a lot of people are past that in terms of their own thinking about spiritualism. <clears throat> I've been a, a spirit-filled for 30 years, and there's a lot of things I don't know. And so at 85, you know, you're still learning. So... Um, Anyway, uh, the adult uh, Sunday school will be the guinea pig for this class called Christian 101. Uh, starts June 6th, next week, and ends the 29th of August. Any questions? See me, please. All right. California, if you didn't know that. All right. <laughs> All right. And as part of that, we... We talk about having breakfast, so and it's a breakfast potluck. So if you want to bring something uh, to share with others, uh, we'll have that set out. We'll eat together, and like you said, for half an hour, and then have a half-hour lesson. So it's a great time. And as Pastor Johnny already mentioned, this, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend, and we want to remember and honor the men and women who have given their lives to, to protect us, to give us the freedoms that too often we take for granted. Um, but we do are very much appreciate and are thankful for the for what they've done. And if you want to join in with others, the the uh, American Legion Honor Guard will be doing military honors tomorrow um, at 10 o'clock. They'll be at the Rosedale Cemetery. At 11 o'clock, they'll be at the Riverside Cemetery. And at 1 o'clock, they'll be doing they'll be at Wilson Park. So if you want to join in with them at any of those times, uh, we. We'd love for you to join at that. If you have any questions, Delia over here can answer your questions for you. And, uh, but we want, do want to continue to honor them and honor what God has done and how he's blessed us through the men and women who have given their lives for us. All right. Well, as I said, last Sunday we had a great time of celebrating the work of the Holy Spirit within us. At baptism, new members, we had all sorts of different things that were going on. Um, and like I said... We're glad that the Holy Spirit is not confined to one day. 
out of the year. But he is continuing to work. He's continuing to move. And we want to continue to celebrate how he continues to work and move in and through our lives. And one of the ways he does that, I'm, uh, I'm going to invite Jim and Penny Winston to come and share how, about how the Holy Spirit worked in and through them as they went back to Washington, D.C. And uh, we're back there to, to share. So, all right. Okay. Are we set to go, Alex? Yeah, there we are. Well, I guess we should have gotten the font just a little bigger on that. So um, for those of you that don't know, um, Penny and I have been involved for uh, several years now uh, on a, an evangelism mission involving uh, National Law Enforcement Memorial Day. Um, a little history on that. President Kennedy first declared that to be May 15th in, starting in 1962 and that day has been celebrated on May 15th every year. In 1991, they dedicated a law enforcement memorial in Washington, D.C. that is about three or four blocks from the Capitol. And they have a wall as part of that memorial with the names engraved of officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty. And with this year's names, that totals up over 22,000 going back as far as the 1700s from all over the country. Um, Penny and I have been uh, involved in doing ministry during that week. They, they also added about 30 years ago, they added a candlelight ceremony, which happens on May 13th, and other various activities that go along. So that whole week has been designated for, for the Washington, D.C. area as police week because they have so many activities going on. And Penny and I have been going back since 2012 with one ministry or another. We started in 2017 uh, joining up with the Fellowship of Christian Peace Officers. Now what a normal year would look like Alrighty. There we go. In a normal year you would have 30 to 40,000 people, officers, co-workers, uh, surviving families from all over the world. We've met officers from Canada. The Bobbies always send a big contingent every year. Um, but on Memorial Day, they have a ceremony at the base of the Capitol. Again, in a normal year. On the 13th, when they have the candlelight ceremony, also down on the Capitol grounds, it gets a little crowded down there. Now, last year, all the events were canceled. Um, this year, they were, they've been postponed, official events have been postponed until October, if they happen at all. Normally, where we're at is a place called Tent City, where they have all these vendors uh, that are set up, and people come by. We have a booth set up there where we hand out free material. We pray with people who are asking for prayer. We, we speak with officers, survivors. Um, and uh, for those that maybe don't care to be prayed for or prayed over, we pray for them as they, as they walk on. Uh, we do not charge for any of the materials that we give out. It's all covered by donations, and we hand everything out for free. And we would normally have a team of 12 to 15 people, again, in a normal year. This year, with everything being canceled, oh, um, yeah. That's all right. An area connection to our memorial is uh, they have the names engraved there. The one that I'm doing the rubbing on there is for Linda Huff, who was uh, a trooper with Idaho State Police. Uh, up until last year, her husband, Chad, was sheriff here in the county. She was uh, killed up in the Coeur d'Alene area uh, many years ago. And also another one that's on that wall is uh, Ronald Feldner from 1984, I believe, who was with Fruitland Police at the time he was killed on duty. So there's local connection to our memorial. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, Penny's thing is we always seem to find each other. Penny and I went out for coffee our first morning there, and in the coffee shop was a captain from the local police department 
So I went over and, and chatted with him for a while. One of the concerns that we had going out this year was that we might not be welcome, uh, not just by citizens, but by local law enforcement who are a little leery maybe of some other outside agency people coming into their area. This captain here gave me his business card with his personal cell phone number and said if we needed anything to call him and he would be there for us. God provided in amazing ways. So this year's team was three of us. That is our memorial, uh, downtown Washington, D.C., with the reflecting pool that is normally full of water. And unfortunately, because of vandalism and uh, broken pump, is was uh, bare this year. They wouldn't allow, they normally have a bicycle tour that rides down from New York and comes down into the memorial to raise money for the memorial. They weren't allowed to come into the district this year because the district would not issue a permit for the activity. So the bicyclists stopped in Annapolis. Their escorting motor unit came on in and made an appearance at the memorial. Penny, I'm going to let you take this one. It's, it's hard to see. In, in the, the first picture on the left, um, inside the area where the wall is, there is a lady sitting on the ground in front of the wall. And I had, I had been watching her after the motorcycles came in. And she'd been sitting there for about 10 or 15 minutes. And I finally walked over. The Lord prompted me, you need to go over and talk to her. And... I bent down and I said, are you doing okay? And she looked up and her eyes were just streaming. Sorry. And I asked her, I said, Who, whose name is on the wall? Is it a friend or a, a spouse? And she said it was her husband. And when I asked her, you know, how long had it been? Um, I thought she said two years. And, and I said, well, you know, the, the pain takes a while to go away. That, that loneliness and the, the sadness of them being gone. And, and I asked her if he was a believer in Jesus Christ, and she said he was. So she knew she would see him again. And I asked, you know, how old were your kids? And she said one and three. So she, she's a widow with a one and a three-year-old. And as I, as, she wa as I walked away, I went back later to look at the picture that's right there. It had been 12 and a half years. It wasn't two, it was 12 and a half and the pain was still there. You know, she may function properly the rest of the time, but when, when you walk up to the wall and you look at that name, it brings back all those emotions. So that's the hardest part of the whole mission trip is watching them cry and trying not to cry while you're trying to talk to them. <laughs> but I was able to pray with her and give her, give her some reassurance and comfort, and she was very grateful for that. So th that's, that's what our mission was this time was just to seek the people out that God prompted us to talk to them pray with them listen sometimes it's just listening you know and tell me about them and then they would talk to you and so that that's that that was my start for this week <laughs> you know as I said normally we have a team of 12 to 15 people this year it was three now we did check in with the place that we normally stay is, um, you might call it an extreme bed and breakfast uh, just outside the district. We are, when we stay there, we are pampered. We are truly blessed. This couple, uh, Ray and Cheryl Prosperi, they volunteered to be the host at this facility, specifically during police week. They want to be there when we're there. And they love on us like no other. They. Uh, yeah, they're, we, we refer to them as our dorm parents. Uh, they, uh, they make sure that we have a good breakfast before we head off at night, and then there's always, or in the morning, there's always cookies when we come home at the end of the day. So it's just a, a wonderful blessing. So we took the opportunity to, even though we weren't staying there this year, to stop in and say hello. Um, we were staying in Arlington, uh, Virginia, and just... Uh, right next to our hotel was their local police department and they had their own memorial uh, set up there. 
Um, while one of the days when we were down at the memorial, there were a uh, there was a contingent of uh, officers from uh, Prince George's County, which is in Maryland, just north of the district, and they came on over and they laid wreaths along the memorial in places where their officers' names were at. And again, you just uh, you see people that show up. This this lady came in. Uh, she lost her husband two or three years ago. She has four children. And they were, they were doing the rubbing of uh, his name on the wall. And the younger children weren't quite grasping, really, the, and you wouldn't expect them to. But her oldest, a teenage son, you could tell from his body language that he was extremely bitter. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't receive a chance to talk a lot with them, but we did, uh, we prayed, that was one of the people we prayed for. So our team this year was Penny and, and myself and uh, our other team member, Mike, or MC Williams. He's uh, out of the Denver, Colorado area. And the three of us felt, knew that there would be people there, even though the events aren't happening. So we said, to heck with the, the shutdown, the, the postponing of everything. We went out to be there for the people that did did arrive um, this was the uh, candlelight ceremony that was on the 13th now normally there would be thousands of people we made our own these gentlemen uh, some of the gentlemen on the right of this picture are from the local fraternal order police chapter they came down some other people arrived the gentleman from uh, FOP brought candles which we uh, we placed along each panel of the wall and then we met back up in the middle of the, uh, of the memorial, and we held our, they had a virtual candlelight service that was broadcast. They got the, the broadcast up on their phone, had a Bluetooth speaker, and we followed along with it, and when they passed candles, we passed candles among us. Uh, other opportunities, uh, we happened to have a lunch break, saw a, a sergeant from D.C. Metro Police Department, and I was able to go over and speak with him. He allowed me to pray with him, and that was a true blessing. So this is our team getting ready uh, to go out the morning of the memorial, which is the 15th. We again, we, we don our Class A's, and uh, a sad note was, we were the only two officers in uniform at our memorial that day from all over the nation. There were others that showed up. Uh, we found out that the local DC Metro officers had been given an order, if you go down to the memorial, you will not be in uniform. But it was uh, truly a blessing for us to still go down there. And not a lot of people showed up. But God sent people, and uh, we were just blessed to be a part of it. We thank you all for your prayers and support for us. We certainly felt them, the anxieties that we thought we were going to face, as we uh, talked about in, in Sunday school class this morning, that worry issue. God took care of it. So thank you all very much, and we uh, appreciate your prayers and your love. Great. Thanks, Jim and Penny. And what a, what a great example of as you are going, make Christ like disciples, right? As you're going through your life, as you're going through your day, make Christ like disciples. And as we continue to celebrate all, all good, God's goodness and how he's continuing to work, um, if you remember last week, uh, we had some members that we brought in, and there were some that we missed from being out of some out of town. Others uh, just missed, but... We want to go ahead and bring them into membership this morning, and so uh, so Danny and Debbie and Sam and Roger, if you guys want to come up here. Well, dearly beloved, 
The privileges and blessings that we have in community together in the church of Jesus Christ are sacred and precious. There is in it such hallowed fellowship, care, and counsel as cannot otherwise be known apart from the family of God. There's the godly care of pastors with the teachings of the word and the inspiration of corporate worship. And there's cooperation in service, accomplishing that which cannot otherwise be done. Today we affirm again the doctrines and practices of the church. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin, that they need the work of forgiveness through Christ and the new birth by the Holy Spirit. That subsequent to this, there is the deeper work of heart cleansing or entire sanctification through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that to each of these works of grace, the Holy Spirit gives witness. We believe that our Lord will return, the dead shall be raised, and that all shall come to final judgment with its rewards and punishments. Today we affirm again the agreed statement of belief for the Church of the Nazarene, that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Old and New Testament scriptures given by plenary inspiration contain all truth necessary to faith and Christian living, that human beings are born with a fallen nature and are therefore inclined to evil, and that continually, that the finally impenitent are hopelessly lost, that the atonement through Jesus Christ is for the whole human race, and that whosoever repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is justified and regenerated and saved from the dominion of sin, that, that believers are to be sanctified wholly subsequent to regeneration through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit bears witness to the new birth and also to the entire sanctification of believers, and that our Lord will return, the dead will be raised, and the final judgment will take place. Do you heartily believe these truths? If so, answer, I do. I do. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you believe that he saves you now? If so, answer, I do by faith. I do by faith. Desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene, do you commit to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself? Do you commit to the mission of God as expressed in the doctrine, fellowship, and work of the Church of the Nazarene? Will you support the teachings of the Church of the Nazarene and strive with God's help to grow in your understanding and practice of the same in a way that enhances the witness of the Church? Will you endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, and holy service? by devotedly giving of your resources, and by faithfully participating in the means of grace? Will you follow Jesus Christ all the days of your life, abstain from evil, and seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life in the fear of the Lord? If so, answer, I will. I will. Well, I welcome you into the Church of the Nazarene and in the fellowship of the Payette Church of the Nazarene with its benefits and responsibilities. May the great head of the church bless and keep you and enable you to be faithful in all good works, that your life and witness may be effective in care for the poor and oppressed and in leading others to Christ. Welcome. Roger. Thanks, Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Yep. Roger's transferring from our Ontario church. Right. Yes. All right. And then we got Danny and Debbie and Sam. And they are coming in by, as members by profession of faith. We welcome you. Glad to have you as part of our family and part of the body. Amen. Thank you. Well, like we said, God is doing amazing things. He's continuing to work. And in his word, he tells us in, in Matthew In John chapter 15, verses 9 through 13, let's stand together as we read this together. Here we go. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. 
You know, and really, as we, if you think about it, that's really what Memorial Day is all about, is we remember the men and women who laid down their lives. It really was an act of love for us, for the world, as they see the freedom, as they, as they sought to help us out. And so in honor of them, we have a video this morning that we want to show as we just remember When I look back through history and consider all the sacrifices in every war and I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves, I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families serving their country, I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom one airman who knew the cost and went anyway, one man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many, and the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. God, we do thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the many ways that you show that love to us. And, and on this day, we especially remember the men and women who gave the ultimate sacrifice to help protect our freedom, freedoms all around the world. And God, we thank you for them. And we lift up their families to you, and we pray, God, that you would watch over them, that you would bring comfort, you'd bring healing, and give peace. And God, in the midst of it, we continue to lift up those who are affected. We lift up our men and women around the world who even now are, are standing up in the place to, to fight and to protect willing to give their lives. We pray for your protection over them. We lift up family members who have people out and pray you'll be with them and give them your peace and your strength. And God, may you remind us to continue to pray, to continue to remember, continue to celebrate your love for us shown through them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we think about it, as we, as we think about all that has been given, we, it's, we just have to remember also the ultimate sacrifice given for us through Jesus. And that he's continuing to march forward, and we march forward with him to help bring freedom and peace into our world today. Amen? Amen. Let's celebrate that too. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is champing out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed his faithful lightning of his terrible strength the sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah.
And God, we do thank you for being with us. We thank you that we know that no matter what happens around us, you are with us. You're at work. You have a plan for us, and you're helping us to move forward with it. And so, God, we pray that you continue to speak to us, continue to teach us, draw us near to you, God. Help us to live your truth out on a daily basis as you fill us and overflow from us with your spirit. We'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 42. I mean, 37 to 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. Last Sunday, as we came together, we, we celebrated Pentecost Sunday, the, the first time the Holy Spirit came to earth to dwell within the hearts of men and women. And we know that in the midst of it, they, they were working from this original commandment from Jesus to, to go make Christ-like disciples, or, or as you're going, to make disciples. And we are seeking on how we can do that as God has called us, as the Payette Church of the Nazarene, as we seek how do we fit into God's plan for the world? How do we fit into God's desire for the world? He's brought us to this place where, where he's given us this mission that as you are going, make Christ-like disciples who love God, love others, love themselves, and serve the world. He's called us to this. But then the question becomes, well, how do we accomplish it? You know, I, I remember in a, when I was growing up, I played a lot of sports, and, and we were constantly looking for this idea of how can we win, right? How can we win? This was, this was, pre, this was pre the everybody's a winner days. Um, and I, I literally... When we were in California, I, I had one of the kids in our church that I was talking to, and, and he, he told me that no matter what, we were the same speed. I said, so you, what you're telling me is if we get out here and we take off at the same time and we run and I get there before you do, that you're still just as fast as I am. Yep, that's right. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. But now we've got this, this world where, where everybody wins. Everybody gets a participation ribbon or something like that. It, and it was interesting because um, I came across someone who wrote and said, you know, actually those ribbons aren't for the kids. They're for their parents. <laughs> and there's a part of me that, that believes that, looks into that. And, and the reality is that no matter how many times we try to say it, no matter how many times we try to deny it, that, that there are times that we win and there are times we lose in life. Aren't there? It, it's just a reality. And, and to claim anything else, to claim that we win all the time or, or that we never lose or we never, is just really setting ourselves up for, for disappointment and heartache and and really, um, to mess us up mentally, relationally, whatever it is. Because, because life, the reality of life is that sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. And so then the question becomes, well, God has given us this mission. He's given us this mission that as we are going, make Christ-like disciples who love God, love others, love themselves, and serve the world. And then we question, well, how can we be winners by accomplishing our mission? How can we actually accomplish our mission so that we can say, hey, we won. We made it. We accomplished what we were called to do, and we followed through. And, and, and you know that, that we know that God is pleased, and we can be pleased with ourselves. And we, and we can know. How can this happen? Well, Jesus told us it, it happens when we through the Holy Spirit, right? In other words, we can't do this. We can't come up with a good enough plan. We can't spend enough time. We can't, we can't uh, put enough energy into it or pool enough talents or resources that we can pull this off. Anybody with me on that? This is not about us. 
The only way this is going to happen, Jesus told the disciples what? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus didn't intend for us to figure this out. Jesus didn't intend for us to try and pull this off on our own. In fact, he knew that we couldn't do it. And so he says, guess what? We love you. My Father and I love you, and we're sending the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And as the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and as he fills you up, not just coming inside of you, but saturates your life, then as you are going you will naturally live out what I desire for you. And bring this out. So then through the Holy Spirit, how can we accomplish our mission? And as we look in Acts 2, 37 to 47, we'll get some insight into what the desire is for God and how we can and what God's plan is for how we can fulfill his mission. Now, in verse 37, we're coming at the end of Peter's sermon. Uh, If you recall, the Holy Spirit came, filled the believers, uh, about 120 of them in the upper room. They went out and began to preach. And as they preached, the Holy Spirit spoke through them. We don't know if they spoke different languages or they just spoke what they knew and the Holy Spirit interpreted into other languages for other people. Believe it or not, I wasn't there, so I can't tell you which one it is. But all we know is that somehow, between these speakers who were Galileans and uneducated, to the, suddenly all these people from all these different countries and all these different languages were hearing the gospel message in their own language to speak to them. And that that was done through the Holy Spirit. All right? And as they, as they listen, as they hear, they're going, they're, they begin to question, what can this mean? How, what kind of situation is this in? Now, there's some in the crowd who begin to make fun of them and say, oh, they're all drunk. That's how they're able to do this. That's why all this is happening, which never made sense to me because it would be the one time in all of history where people got drunk and it made them smarter. (sighs) Okay? Uh, So that can't be the answer. But instead, the Holy Spirit living inside of Peter Peter stands up and begins to speak, which is a miracle in and of itself. Because if you recall, the last time we saw Peter in with any people, he was was cowering before a servant girl, denying that he even knew Jesus. Now he's got thousands of people around him, and rather than cowering, what does he do? He stands up. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit inside him. This wasn't Peter pulling this off. This was the Holy Spirit through Peter, and he begins to preach. And he begins to tell him, he begins to explain the coming of the Holy Spirit that, and the life of Jesus and, and that Jesus died for their sin and that they need to receive Jesus and listen to him. And, and, and at the end of his sermon in verse 37, it says, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, God, that you have a plan for us. And it's a plan that gives us the best life possible. But that God also in this plan is a way for us to be fruitful and fulfilled in our lives as well. And so, God, we pray that you would show us how we can, we can accomplish that plan and how we can be winners in you today. What you desire how you want to live in and through our lives. And through it all, may you be honored and glorified, for we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. 
So how can we accomplish our mission? Peter and, and, and well, Luke writing the book of Acts has come to us and said, here's, here's how you accomplish your mission. The first thing, if you want to accomplish your mission, is you have to know the purpose, right? You have to know the purpose. You have to actually know what the mission is and what the purpose of the mission is. Because without that, you know, you would, we tend to quit. We, we don't want to keep with it or keep going. It's kind of like the, the group of guys where, where they're with their supervisor. They were working for, uh, for the gas company, and, and they were out, and they went out, and the supervisor took them to this place, and he said, okay, guys, I need you to dig a, dig a hole. It needs to be 10 feet wide, 10 feet long, and 6 feet deep. And they, they dig it, and he says, okay, fill it back in. And they go to another place. He says, I need you to dig another hole. Same to it, 10 by 10, 6 feet deep. They dig it. Okay, fill it back in. And, and they come to the third place, and, and the guys are going, uh-uh. We're not doing this. And so as he says, I need you to dig a hole here, they, they go, no, we're not going to. He says, why are you having us dig this hole, these holes? You know, are you just messing with us? He says, no, guys. He says, we, we've, got a, we've got a leak in a gas pipe. And we're trying to find it. And suddenly they were all willing to dig. Why? Because now they had a purpose. They had a purpose. We need to have purpose in our lives. In fact, one of the accounts given from World War II in the concentration camps, one of the things the Nazis wanted to do was to break the, break the spirits of the, of the Jews and the others that were contained in their camps. And so they, they took them out and, and they started hard labor. And they went out and they would build roads and do all this stuff. They were trying to just break them and, and it didn't work. Until one day, a guy came up with an idea. He took them out and there was a pile of, of logs that were there, of trees. And he said, okay, you guys move that pile over to this pile, over to this side. And so they do it. They get it done. The next day they come out, he says, you're going to move them from there back to where they originally were. And the next day they came out, move them from there to there. And in the purposelessness of that, they found that many of their spirits were broken. Because when they were building a road or doing something else, at least they had a purpose. But as soon as the labor of the work became meaningless... It broke them. Why? Because we were created for purpose. We were created to have meaning in our lives. And so we need to come, and as, as we look at this, and we go, wow, we've got this, we've got this calling, we, we've got this commission that as we're going, make Christ-like disciples who love God, love others, love themselves, and serve the world. If we're going to be with us, if we're going to continue to walk with the Spirit in this, we have to have purpose. And realize, why do we want to do this? Why, what is our purpose in doing this? Is it because Pastor Tim stood in front of us and said, yeah, we need to do this? Is it because the church board said, hey, this is what, where we think God wants us to go? What is our purpose? And as we come in here, as we, we find our purpose in verse 47, in, in the second half of verse 47 here. It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's our purpose. Peter tells us that, that it is the will of God that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. God's purpose is to save people. God's purpose is to give life to people. God's purpose is to see people rescued out of the world and brought into his kingdom. God's purpose is to see people freed from their sin and moved into a life that God created them to live, a holy life. That is God's purpose. That's his will. And he has called us to join him in that purpose. That none should perish, but all should come to repentance. That everyone, anyone who would call on the name of the Lord would be saved and have new life. And according to John 10, 10, and what Jesus said, and have the best life possible. That is God's purpose. And we need to understand that needs to become our purpose. That as long as there's any individual on the face of this earth that is not in relationship with God, that we have a purpose, and God has a calling. He says, I want to reach that individual. 
I want to get to that individual and I want to see them brought back into relationship with me so that they can receive the life they were created for. Which means that we need to change our outlook on life. We need, we need to change how we tend to view others around us. See, too often we, we tend to look at the world and we have a very negative approach to them. Oh, that's the world. Either we become fearful. Maybe they're going to corrupt us. We don't I don't know. Or else we have a very judgmental attitude towards them of, well, look what they, oh, look how bad they are. Look at all this stuff. Look at how messed up that, look at, look, look. Right? When was the last time we looked at the world, myself included, looked at the world and we were heartbroken? We were broken over the lostness and the, and the hurt and the pain and the, and the turmoil that sin had brought into the lives of people. When was the last time we, we looked at the world and went, these are our brothers and sisters. They're our brothers and sisters. They're prodigals, but they're our brothers and our sisters. And our Heavenly Father is longing for them to come home. And we should be too. We should be longing for them to come home. This isn't about us and them. We, we, tend to, we tend to get the idea that we're, we're at war with them. We're not at war with them. The Word tells us that, that we're in a spiritual battle. Our battle isn't against them. It's, our battle is against no flesh and blood. Our battle is against spiritual enemies who are trying to take over. And, and they're just captives. You know, we talk about it on a day like Memorial Day. We can look at them. They are POWs. They're prisoners of war. And they need to be set free. And while God can go out and God can just, could just do things miraculously, and, and we, we have accounts of how God has gone out in dreams and different ways to speak to people and get given visions, his number one way, his number one plan for reaching the people who are, who are, not, who are out there is through us. It's through us. And as we are going through our lives, and as we're doing it, I wonder, how many of you, how many of you have a, a relative, maybe a child or a parent, a friend, someone you know of, that you are praying for that they would be saved? Anyone, anyone with me on this? Okay. And you are praying, you are praying that God is going to bring somebody into their life who will represent him well so that they will be attracted to a relationship with him. You, anybody praying for that? Have you ever thought about that every individual you come in contact with, there may be somebody praying for them? saying, God, would you please bring someone into their life who will represent you well and in a way that they would be attracted to a relationship with you. And that maybe, just maybe, God wants you to be the answer to their prayers. And as we are out, and as we are about, as, as we are looking at our purpose, that none should perish, but all should come to repent, that God would add to their numbers daily those who are being saved. What if instead of, of viewing people as our enemies or, or those we are fighting against, we instead begin to view them as, you are a divine appointment. 
God has set us up for a divine appointment that I may love you in his name and I may treat you in such a way that God is well represented in your life. What a difference that would make. If we begin to think, listen, the Holy Spirit inside of me who I am allowing to saturate my life has one desire. He wants me to slop him all over you. And when we, and when we are done with this encounter, you may not realize what has just happened, but you'll notice a difference. What a difference could that make in our lives and in the lives of the people around us? But we have to know our purpose. We have to know it. God wants to save people. That's his purpose. That's his goal. He is so committed to it, Jesus, his own son, died to bring it about. So how can we accomplish our mission? Number one, know our purpose. We have to know our purpose. And then as we, as we know the purpose, as we're preparing, we have to then know the process. That God has a desire and, and that God has helped us and he has, a, he has a process for us. We find this in verses 42 to 47. It says what? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Okay? What's the process for, for preparing to, to win? What's the process for preparing to accomplish our mission? Number one... Holy Spirit has to saturate us, right? But then there are things we can do to help in that. And the first thing it says is they devoted themselves. All right? They devoted themselves. And that word, you know, we have this word devoted. And if you think of the word devoted, what comes to mind? What's some words that come to mind if you get the word devoted? What's that? Commitment? Faithful, dedicated, steadfast, what? Integrity, a mother, yeah, love, yeah, and all those are, and those are a part of this, but, but it, this word of, of devoted is, they had made a commitment that nothing, nothing would keep them from these things that they're going to do, Okay. They devoted themselves to it. it, it it's so far, it, it's life or death to them. In their mind, they're going, this is life and death. And really it is, if you, want to, if you think about it. They go, we, these things, you know, we're, we're pretty good. We, we have some things we're devoted to. I'm pretty devoted to food. Anybody with me? There's people who are really devoted to coffee. Right? Or other things, you know, I'm kind of devoted to air, <laughs> you know. But, but we have some things that we're devoted to, and nothing will keep us away from it. But, but let's look at what, what things they were devoted to in order to help in this process of, of, of the saturation of the Spirit. It says what they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. Okay, they had the, the, the 12 apostles there who had been with Jesus, and now we're teaching them what Jesus had taught them. Well, guess what? We don't have the 12 apostles in the flesh with us, do we? They're all gone. But guess what? We still have their teaching. We have their teaching in the Word of God. 
And it's, the, and it's their teaching. And just as the Holy Spirit spoke through the apostles in order to teach these individuals and help them to learn and to grow, God will speak to us through his Spirit, through his word, and will teach us what we need to know and what we need to do. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But the reality is for most of us, well, you guys are probably different than every other church in the world, but... Uh, but for most of, most of the people in the church, this sits on the shelf or on the coffee table and looks good or on the nightstand, never to be opened until Sunday morning. Guess what? That doesn't work. That doesn't work. I hear people all the time saying, I wish God would speak to me. Duh, the word of God. Okay? This is his chosen method that through his spirit speaking to us, through his word. He's given it to us, and, and it's there to reveal himself to us and to teach us about the lives we're supposed to live and the life God created us to live. But guess what? You don't get this by osmosis. You can't set this under your pillow and somehow it'll magically fill your head and your heart. You actually have to open it and spend time in it. And, and, and if you're going, well, what should I read? I've given you help. If you look at the bottom of your, uh, of your notes sheet there, I've given you what I'm preaching on next week. All right? This has two purposes in that. One, I want you, the number one, I want you to read it throughout the week. Spend some time praying over it. Allow the Spirit to talk to you about what is in that passage or, or in that stuff. For two purposes. One, if you've read it and you've already begun the process of the Holy Spirit speaking to you through the week, then guess what? When we come here Sunday morning together, your, your learning and growth is going to be enhanced because it won't be something brand new that you're listening to and trying to process. You've already been in conversation with the Spirit about it throughout the week. The second thing, and equally as important, is if you've read and you've studied and the Spirit's been talking to you about it, you can help hold me accountable. making sure I'm preaching the truth and coming out. And, and it's really interesting because I've, I've had people get, uh, question me on stuff throughout my ministry, and, and they always start off with an apology. I'm sorry, but I just, don't, I just don't agree. Don't apologize. We're supposed to hold each other accountable. I don't mind questions. It's a good thing. I, I tell you, I would much rather have people come into me with questions because they've actually listened to what I was saying and are processing and trying to work on it than all the times people have come to me and said, hey, great sermon, and you talk to them 15 minutes later and they don't even remember what it was about. Okay? We need to process it. We need to spend time and wrestle with it with the Spirit. But that means we need to get in the Word of God. We need to spend time. They devote themselves to the apostle teaching, to the fellowship, and to fellowship. What is fellowship? It's a potluck. We go eat and have fun together. That's what it's become. After all, we have our fellowship hall, right? Which I'm not saying we need to rename it, but I'm saying we've, we've missed out so much on really what God desires in fellowship. Fellowship is unity. Fellowship is coming together, having a common purpose, a common goal, a common direction in our lives, and saying we're doing, we are living life together. Fellowship means that, that we celebrate together when things are going well in people's lives. Fellowship means we weep together when things are, when things are difficult, and we struggle together through the difficulties and the problems. That's what fellowship is. And then if you want to throw a little bit of food in, that's okay. But that's not the goal. All right? But we need to commit ourselves to fellowship. 
to truly being brothers and sisters, to, to truly uniting together and being one body and realizing that our fellowship is not just with this body, but did you know there's other Christian churches in the town of Payette? There are. And guess what? They're our brothers and sisters, and we're supposed to be in fellowship with them too. There's other Christian churches throughout, throughout the state of Idaho and Oregon and all around us, and guess what? We're supposed to be in fellowship with them too as one body. There's, there's Christian churches all throughout our nation. And we're supposed to be in fellowship with each of them too. In fact, the, the Word of God says that, that we are called to be in fellowship with God in unity with Him and fellowship with all of our brothers everywhere, brothers and sisters anywhere and everywhere all around the world. And we're supposed to be devoted to that fellowship which means we're supposed to be devoted to each other and to all the other believers around the world and realize that that we are a part of that body and we're a part of them and they are a part of us so they devoted themselves to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer to the breaking of bread we're going to celebrate communion to to remembering Jesus, to remembering what God has done in our lives through Jesus and, and to have that unity together in Christ, remembering that, that we are all equal. We are one body. And to prayer, to seeking God together as individuals and as a body, that we would seek God simply to grow closer to Him that we would realize that, that the purpose of prayer is, is to bring ourselves into alignment with God's will. So we seek His will, we seek His guidance, we seek His direction. Not only do, what, does he, what does He want to do, but how does He want it done? And that we would trust Him in that. We're constantly seeking to grow in that relationship. It says everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. You know, it's, it's interesting because I, because I look at this and go, if, if, if your Bible is the same as mine or most of it I read, uh, it says Acts, and, and oftentimes it says Acts of the Apostles, right? That's a bad title for this. The apostles didn't do anything that we read about in the book of Acts other than show up. <laughs> But in reality, it should say acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And so when it says there, there are signs and wonders the apostles were doing, it wasn't the apostles that were doing them. It was the Holy Spirit through the apostles that was doing these acts. Just as it was the Holy Spirit through Jesus that enabled him to do what he did. And guess what? That same spirit is the same spirit living inside of us. And I hear people all the time going, well, why doesn't the spirit work today like it did back then? He does. He does. It's just that we have a problem. We're really good at voicing our concerns and our requests and the things we need God to do. We are absolutely terrible at coming back later and saying, guess what? God showed up. Listen to what he did. Look at how he worked. Listen to how he worked in my life or in this situation. We are terrible at that. Because usually by then we've come up with another request. And so a big reason why we don't hear about it is, number one, we don't attribute some things to God's work. Oh, God didn't heal me. The surgeon did. Who do you think gave him that skill or her that skill? To do that or gave the wisdom or the knowledge to know how to do it. it wasn't out of their head trust me you know, or, or else or else we don't we don't attribute it to God we say it's medicine or it's some other thing that happened rather than hey God prompted or God worked God moved to provide these things James tells us every good and perfect gift comes from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadow 
So whatever, whatever earthly means it came through, it originated with God. We got to know that. And I think another reason why we don't see it is we just don't believe. We don't trust. We, we, we tend to try and make excuses for God instead. Well, God, we need you to do this. But if you don't... We need to learn to listen to the Spirit because when the Spirit tells us, hey, pray for this, hey, pronounce this, hey, speak this, when the Spirit tells us to, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We just don't trust. We don't trust that it's going to happen. I mean, I've, I've talked to people from, from other countries and they and they they go wow. You wouldn't believe what what the Holy Spirit's doing among us. I had one guy who's a friend. He came from Africa. He's a missionary. He's an evangelist in Africa. Came and and we were talking. And he says, "Yeah, my my six year old son. My six year old son. He says if you're sick, he'll walk up to him, pray for you. He says, and if you get up, you'll be healed." And it's taken for granted. It's not, well, you might be, well, if God does No, it's just, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And we can make all sorts of excuses about why it does it there. Oh, because they're a third world country. They don't have all the advancements we have here. Well, they don't have the understanding or the knowledge we have to be able to attribute to what it's supposed to be or whatever. I'll tell you what the real difference is. We don't have the devotion that they have. We don't trust the Spirit like they trust the Spirit. One, one of my funnest things to do is when we have missionaries come and speak, oftentimes get to take them for lunch afterwards. If you ever get this opportunity with a missionary, do it. And take them to lunch or you get together with them. And then say, then say, now, will you tell me the stories you can't tell in church of what God is doing? Most of our missionaries have to sanitize their presentations because if they really brought out what God was doing, we'd get freaked out here in America. And we wouldn't believe them. And what God is calling us to and what he's saying is, hey, would you guys get so devoted to my spirit, so in love with my spirit, so committed to my spirit working in and through your life that you listen and you just obey and trust my spirit, he'll come through. That's what he's calling us to. That's what he's expecting of us. And here in America... We call that super Christians, right? Those are the holy rollers. Those are the, those are the really spiritual ones. They're the ones that are, you know, the outstanding super Christians. They're the saints of the church. You know what they called them here in Acts? New believer. They said, no, that's not super, that's basic Christianity in the book of Acts. Total commitment, devotion to God, listening to His Spirit, living in the power of the Spirit, that's basic Christianity. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone in, who had need. When you're committed to the fellowship, you take care of the fellowship, right? Even to the point of sacrificing. We take care of each other. We watch out for each other. We're going to do... An, to anyone as they had need. It says, every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. <laughs> and we're battling over what's the, which day was, is the Sabbath. You know what they did? They said, every day is the Sabbath. Go worship. Let's meet together. Let's worship. Let's, let's praise God every day. Amen. 
well, we might be able to make it on this Sunday. There's a prayer meeting tonight on top of that. What do they expect of us? Don't you know how busy our lives are? Don't you know what all we have to do? And in all of that, what we're really saying is, don't you know what we're really devoted to? Because you will make time for the things you're devoted to. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts. In other words, they weren't just in the fellowship at church. They took people home with them. They went to each other's homes. They ate together. They, they continued to grow to get to know each other, to truly know each other, and to be connected with each other. It says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, don't misunderstand that. That does not mean everybody liked them. Enjoyed the favor of all the people. In fact, this is the time where they're being put to death for their beliefs, okay? So it's not that everybody liked them, but what this enjoyed the favor of means that everybody respected them. Because they lived out what they proclaimed. And they lived out what they said they believed. And so whether people liked them, whether people agreed with them, whether people hated them or at least hated the Jesus within them, they were always respected because they lived out what they said. You could trust in that. There's the process. We want to accomplish the mission. Will we be devoted to the process? We'll be devoted to the things that will enable us and prepare us to be a part of the mission. We'll be, de we'll be devoted to those things that will help us to truly allow the Holy Spirit to saturate our lives so that we can go out in the power of the Spirit and live the lives through the Spirit that God created us to live. That's the question. Will we be devoted and then, once we know the purpose and once we know the process, we need to know the proclamation. We need to know the proclamation. What's the proclamation? Verse 38 to 40. The Peter, people came, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, the Lord, of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. There's our proclamation. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. How do we do that? Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent, turn Turn, listen to God's voice, and choose to align yourself with Him and what He wants. If that means you're living a sinful life, accept His forgiveness and get turn, pointed in the right direction with Him. If that means you're trying to live, with him, live the life He wants you to and you're going this way and you find He's going this way, <laughs> turn. <laughs> get into alignment with Him. If you've been walking with Him and He's been having you do this thing and now He's saying, now we need to go over this direction... Turn with him and go with him. That's what repentance is. Get in alignment with God. Stay in alignment with God. As he shows you, as he introduces you to new things, and as he continues to lead your life, stay in alignment with God, whatever that means for you. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We've taken that so out of context in our world. So often he said, oh, they're not truly saved if they're not baptized. Yes, they're saved. This whole baptism in should be translated baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Which really has to do with who are you going to identify as? Who are you going to identify with? Are you going to choose to identify with the world and the things of this world? Are you going to choose to identify with Jesus Christ and the things of God? Where's your identity going to come from? 
Who are you going to align yourself with? The world or Christ? That's the question. Baptize into the name of Jesus Christ or baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Whose will are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the will of the world or are you going to follow the will of Christ? Well, I follow my own will. That's the will of the world. Well, I like it both ways. <laughs> the world owns the fence. We need to be proclaiming to people, there's only one way to the Father, there's only one way to eternal life, that's through Jesus Christ. And to live the life God created you for, you're going to need to receive his forgiveness, and you're going to need to allow the Holy Spirit to saturate your life. That's the only way it's going to happen. Well, there's so many ways to God. No, not, not according to the Bible. There's one way, Jesus Christ and his blood, and we need to repent and turn to that. Well, I have all this other stuff I've reasoned out. All your reasoning or all the reason of all these intelligent individuals here on earth, when you compare all of that to, to the intelligence of God, it all says one thing. Because we're sheep. Right? And however much we can reason out or figure out or try and think, if it doesn't match up with the word of God, throw it out. Throw it out. Why? Because we need to align ourselves one way and one way only, and that is with Jesus Christ. And that needs to be our message, unapologetically. But that's not politically correct. Who do you think crucified Jesus? The politics of the day. Jesus was not politically correct. And his message and his word and his kingdom is countercultural to this world. We just have to accept that. Well, there might be some people that don't like me. You don't crucify someone you like. People didn't like Jesus. There might be some people that reject me. They rejected Jesus. And really what it comes down to is we need to come to the place of saying, Whose opinion really matters to us? Is it going to be the opinion of this world, or is it going to be God's opinion of us? And that's a choice we have to make. And that needs to be our message. God loves you. God cares about you. He wants you to be saved, but there's only one way to be saved. You have to receive his forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and you have to allow his Holy Spirit to come live inside of you and saturate your life. Any other way does not work. And it's not because we hate you. It's because we truly do love you, and we want you to succeed. And as we come and as we're moving forward, and God has called us to this mission of as we're going, make Christ-like disciples. How are we going to be able to accomplish that? How are we going to be able to win at that? Number one, know our purpose. Our purpose is that the whole world would be saved. We're joining together with God in his purpose. We need to know the process. We must be devoted to the things of God to his word, to prayer, to the fellowship, to, to joining together, to worshiping together, to eating together and living life together. We need to be devoted to those things. And we have one proclamation. Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and be filled with his spirit. That's our proclamation. That's who we are. That's who God called us to. The question is, Will we do it? Will we join him? Will we allow God to make us ready to accomplish his mission? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being with us. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you, God, that, that your desire is that we would have life and have the best life possible. You've given us everything we need through Jesus dying and, and providing for the forgiveness of sin, by sending your Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to not just dwell there, but to saturate our lives and, and to transform us to be like Jesus. 
so that we can live the lives you created us to live. God, help us to be devoted to the things that will help us grow in that relationship and grow closer to you. And through it all, may you be honored and glorified. And may you be pleased. And we look forward to what you're going to do in and through us as we continue to allow you to transform us to be who we were created to be. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite the worship team to come back up as we continue to worship and to celebrate. We're going to celebrate through communion. Remember, it says breaking bread together. They were celebrating communion, remembering the life of Jesus, remembering how much God loves us and what all he had done to get us into the kingdom, to get us to the point where we could join him in accomplishing his mission. And I want to invite Pastor Johnny and those who are going to be helping to, to come forward at this time. And they're going to be bringing around the, the elements there's, in a self-contained cup, there's a piece of cellophane over the top of the wafer. Um, as it comes, uh, you may want to pull that off and have that ready. Then there's a foil cover for the juice. We'd ask that when you receive it, that you wait, that we could celebrate together as one body in union. In the Church of Nazareth, we practice what's called open communion. That means that if, if you're someone who's seeking God, seeking to follow God, and trying to live the life he created you for, then you are welcome to join with us. For we are one body celebrating in him. We encourage you to take this time to, to think about what God has spoken to you, to think about what's your next step. What has he called you to? Are you allowing him to work in and through you? Let's worship. This is the air I breathe.
haven't already, if you want to pull back that cellophane piece. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus was sharing a meal with his disciples. And as part of the meal, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. This morning as we take and as we eat, with, let's eat with celebration and thanksgiving that Jesus was willing to allow himself to be beaten in our place, that by his stripes we are healed, but also to eat in commitment that Jesus, we will join you in your purpose and in your will. Take and eat with thanksgiving. And after the meal, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is my blood. The blood of a new covenant for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. This morning as we take and drink, we encourage you to do a celebration and thanksgiving. Thanking Jesus for giving up his life, shedding his blood, so that your sin and my sin could be forgiven. And we could be given eternal life. But also, do it as a commitment of saying, and I'm going to live for you. I'm devoting myself to you and to your way and to your purpose. As you lead, as you enable, as you empower through your spirit, take and drink with thanksgiving. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence with us, for your work in and through our lives, and how you continue to, to work to make us and give us the best life possible. We thank you, for Jesus, for your sacrifice, that you were willing to be beaten and broken and, and killed. You shed your blood so our sin could be forgiven, we could be brought back into relationship. God. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for coming and being willing to live inside of us, to continue to mold us and make us and help us and empower us so we can live the lives we were created to live and that we can bring honor and glory to the Father and that we can join you in your purpose, that all may come to repentance and all may be saved. Help us to vo devote ourselves to you and to the things that will help us to grow and to become more and more the people you create us to be. And may you be honored and glorified in and through our lives. For we do love you and we praise you. And we thank you for how you continue to work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for coming. Thanks for taking this time to come and to worship together. Hopefully God has spoken to you. The Spirit's continuing to work and to move in your life. And we're looking forward to all that you have, that God has for us. Man, if you're interested in the fishing, don't forget, quick meet, five-minute meeting right up front here. Uh, we've got lots of things coming up. Don't forget, next Sunday, uh, lunch with the leaders, other things going on. 
check your bulletin, check the website, and we'd love to have you out in whatever we can, and we're looking forward to that. But thanks for coming. We look forward to great days ahead. May you have a great week. We'll hope to see you back again next week. God bless.